Welcome once again to Midweek Word, the weekly Bible study of the Zion Gate Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Ron Bartlett, and once again, I'm glad that you've joined with us for our ongoing study series. Please consider becoming a subscriber to our YouTube channel. It helps support our channel and the efforts of our Christian Education Department. If you believe that we're doing a good job, hit the like button, leave us a comment in the comments section down below. We are still in volume number six, and we are at the second part of lesson number six, which is entitled, The Ministry of the Missionary. Once again, this is a continuation of the Apostle Paul really opening up on some issues that he needed to cover with the Roman congregation because Paul is the quintessential example of what a missionary and what mission work really should be all about. So this is a relatively long lesson, a lot of ground to cover, and we may not get all of it covered again tonight. So again, we're picking up in Romans chapter 15, and I want to begin reading from verse number 20, going down towards verse number 31. And as always, we're using the New King James Version of the Bible. Romans 15 and 20. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company, for a, a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia to make, a, make certain contributions for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let's pick up in item number six in our outline, and that is the plan in the ministry. Back at verse 20, it says, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, least I should build on another man's foundation. The plan for the Apostle Paul was very basic and it should still apply for most ministries today. True evangelism does not include the idea of just taking and reworking somebody else's church or trying to reorganize an existing church or stealing members from different churches. Paul recognized the idea that there were enough unsaved people who needed to hear the gospel, that needed to be reached with the good news, that there was no reason to be stealing folks from other places. This goes to the simple idea that church planting should be done very deliberately. 
and it should be done in places where church do not presently exist. Unfortunately, the real history of too many modern churches is the fact that its origins start with anger or division rather than a real, genuine, prayerful plan to meet a need. Now, that's not always the case, but a lot of churches are organized after a split, after a fight, and then one minister will go one direction and take half the congregation, and the other minister goes in a different direction and takes half the membership, and they go and start something different someplace else. Paul does not build on another man's work, nor does he seek to take people out of another fellowship. His mission, his purpose, his place is to reach those that are lost. And this is the primary difference between evangelism and pastoral ministry. There are many, many great preachers who make very poor pastors because the emphasis and their gift is towards evangelism and preaching and the idea of pastoral work although it involves preaching and it involves evangelism is a different type of ministry takes us to point number seven the prophecy in the ministry verse 21 but it is written to whom he has not announced they shall see and those who have not heard shall understand. Paul is making it clear that his calling, his purpose, is to reach the Gentiles and the, that the fact that his reaching the Gentiles is actually the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The quote that he just gave there really comes from Isaiah chapter 52 verse number 15. And he is essentially stating to those that were not a part of the original promise, the original Abrahamic covenant, they will have the opportunity presented to, to them. And then he goes a little bit further to say, not only will it be presented to them, but the text goes on to say, they shall understand. People accept the truth of the gospel when they are open and receptive to listen to it and then to receive it. Again, this goes to the fact that you cannot force anybody to accept the gospel if they haven't opened their own mind and their own heart to receive it. You cannot force it to them. You cannot force feed it to people. <clears throat> and that's part of the problem that we have with trying to use laws to force people to become Christians. Some of you may have recently read one of the former president's advisors made a, a pitch towards a bunch of evangelical Christians and stated that we need to establish one religion in America. And that is a total contradiction to everything that America's founding documents was based around. And all of us who are people of faith and understand anything about the history of this nation really ought to step back and take a deep breath because this really ought to bring us to a point of pause. First reason it ought to bring us to a point of pause is the hypocrisy because America as a nation will oftentimes decry what's going on in Muslim countries, especially those that are enforcing Sharia law because Sharia law is in many times is repressive against gender and is repressive against non-Muslim people. And it is based solely upon one group's interpretation of the Quran. And now people are actually ready to contemplate doing the same thing in America, but people are ready to embrace it because it's Christian and now it makes it right. Again, I say you cannot force faith. And if it's one thing that governments should have learned by now, that rules do not change hearts or change minds. Punishment does not change people's hearts. Oaths made under duress do not hold. 
the entire idea of the gospel ought to be to bring about a change that comes from the inside. Now, the reality is we know that they're just simply trying to rally enough support to justify getting rid of people that they want to persecute, like Muslims and Jews and Native American culture and, God forbid, black people. But all of these ideas go clearly against what the apostle is teaching in Scripture. You do not convert people by force or by coercion. Years ago, the Spanish Inquisition tried this, and it didn't work. The Nazis tried to separate people by religion against the Jews, and it didn't work. True transformative faith does not happen by being mandated or inflicted on people. This is something you see when uh, certain groups baptize babies and automatically make them members of the church. Just because you've baptized a baby does not make them grow up to become good, faithful Christian people. So we need to understand that. Now Paul goes on to say that to whom he was not announced, they shall see. Even when you go all the way back to the beginning of the Gospels, the birth announcement of Jesus Christ was predicted in prophecy. And those within Israel, those within the government of Israel, missed it. And they missed it to the point that it required foreigners to come in and ask the question, where is he who was born king of the Jews? The birth of Christ was announced to shepherds instead of the priesthood. And it was announced to them because they had a heart that was open to receive the word and the will of God. Paul is busy in a ministry that is converting Gentiles to the gospel because they are receptive to the gospel. When people open their hearts, God can touch them. God will reach them. Takes me to point number eight. The pathway in the ministry. Now, if you want to be technical, all of the theology of the letter that Paul is writing to the Romans is now completely and totally finished. The rest of this letter is basically housekeeping. He's dealing with logistics. He's dealing with planning. He's dealing with a lot of other sidebar issues. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is a reason for you to tune out and say, well, we're done with all of the, quote, religious stuff, unquote. We're dealing with a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that keeps going on. But this stuff becomes important because the letters that Paul the Apostle wrote were not written in a vacuum. He's addressing people and he's addressing certain issues. So let's pick up verse 22. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this, and have sealed them in this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now what the apostle is saying is his personal desire for a long time has been to come to Rome. And this ought to prove something to us that the church in Rome was established long before the Apostle Paul got there, long before Peter ever arrived. 
How did it get there? It's because of the work of those unnamed saints who took the gospel from Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and followed the will of God to take it to other places and shared what they learned on Pentecost. And this ought to emphasize to all of us that ministry is not restricted only to the clergy. Now Paul is also admitting he's had some difficulties. Back in verse 20, in 22 he said he was much hindered. Now this could be everything from lack of financial support at the time, personal health issues, scheduling, access, couldn't find a ship. It could have been any number of different things or any combination of things. Because this is what life does. Everything in our lives is not always going to be simple. Everything in our life is not always going to go according to our plans and according to our ideas. We live in a world where we have to deal with stuff. And dealing with stuff, dealing with the things of this world, does not make you unholy, but it just simply acknowledges the fact that we deal with a lot of different issues in this world. Verse 23, he says, But now, no longer having a place in these parts. We believe that the Apostle Paul is in Corinth, and he is basically closing down the ministry and the mission there. His plans are to leave Greece and then to eventually launch a mission into modern-day Spain. But these are the plans that he has made, and he also includes in his plans a trip that God did not instruct him to make. Verse 25, for it says, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Paul has decided to do what the Holy Spirit will warn him not to do. And you can find that reference in Acts chapter 21. But Paul will decide to do it anyway and will eventually wind up in prison in Jerusalem. Which should also reinforce in our own minds that even godly people make mistakes. Saints oftentimes ignore the warning signs that God places in our lives and we make real world mistakes. Stop beating yourself up because you've made some mistakes in your life. It only makes you normal. Now you can call it whatever you want. Call it your personal pride, arrogance, being hard-headed. People of godly purpose are still capable of screwing up. Paul is stating that his purpose, his plans, are to go to Jerusalem. And after that, I plan to go back to Spain. The reality is those plans will never quite materialize because Paul will wind up being thrown into prison when he arrives in Jerusalem. And that's found in Acts chapter 21, verse number 26. His reason for going to Jerusalem is a noble one. He's planning on taking an offering which has been collected in Macedonia and Acacia for the relief of the people who are in Jerusalem who at this point in time are dealing with a famine. Let me stick a pin here. The text says something that we oftentimes overlook. Look again back at verse 26. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. The offering to help Jerusalem was for the relief of the saints. Now, there were unsaved poor within the same city. They were dealing with a famine which was affecting everybody. But the stated mission of the church was to relieve those that were a part of the community of faith, not necessarily the community at large. Churches often do vast community outreach for the poor, help out the needy in an area, but a church should never do more for the unsaved than it will do for those that are a part of the church. We often do feeding programs and other community-based efforts without really putting enough focus and emphasis on making evangelism the primary focus. Too many times we're willing to give the poor a meal 
and call it a day. And our purpose really ought to be trying to reach those that are lost with that opportunity that that feeding may present to us, but to give them the gospel. What Paul is doing, what Paul, the offering that Paul has received from the Macedonians and the Acacians is designed to help those that are already a part of the body of Christ through the crisis that they're dealing with. You need to, to make sure that the church gets the help it needs in order to survive. Listen, have you ever listened to the instructions that they give you on an airplane when they start talking about the oxygen mask that will drop down if, if the cabin depressurizes? They tell you that if you're traveling with others, put your mask on first before you try to assist somebody else with theirs. Because if you pass out, you can't help them. So the idea is the obligation for the local church ought to be to help the people that belong to that fellowship, to help those that are part of the body of Christ, and to use that opportunity to help them in order to position yourself to help others. Yes, it can and it should be the goal of the church to try and reach out and help everyone it can but it should never sacrifice the needs of its own in order to reach others. Furthermore, there's also a stated obligation among the Gentiles that if you've been converted to help meet the needs of the people who are in Jerusalem. And the reason you ought to be trying to help them is you are a beneficiary of the gospel that came forth from Jerusalem. Look in the B part of verse 27. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Now, once again, there's a lot to unpack within that statement. And I really feel in order to do justice to this part of the study, once again, we need to take more time than we have in this present space. So I'm going to once again, stick a pin right here, and we're going to pick up the same passage in the next lesson and try to get on through to the end of that chapter. Let us bow in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for the opportunity to call on your name. Help us in our study as we understand what mission work is all about and what the purpose of the church really is. Continue to open our minds, continue to feed our hearts, and help us to gain the insight we need that we all become better Christians for having partaken of this time. It's in the blessed name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you for taking this time to share with us. If you believe that this study has been a benefit to you, take the time, hit the like button, comment in the comment section down below, Share this video with somebody else that might benefit from it. And please, once again, consider becoming a subscriber to the Zion Gate YouTube channel. Also, if you want to continue with your financial support for the church, consider using one of our online portals or drop something in the mail. Once again, I thank you and may God continue to bless you.